Hare Krishna, Ishwar Krishna Prabhu. Thank you very much for joining today for the Monks podcast. Ever since I read your book on the structure and the philosophy of the Gita, and then I met you in Radha Gopina Temple, I have had a desire to discuss the Gita with you and uh, to invite you on this podcast. So I feel among the many devotee scholars in our in our movement, you are among the handful, or you are I would say very very few who have actually focused singularly on the Gita. So it's quite distinctive. Uh, the work that you are doing so thank you very much for taking time and joining today hari krishna chitra charan prabhu thank you so much for your kind invitation i'm i'm very much appreciative of your work your books i have some of your uh, writings with me and I, i i think your approach the spiritual scientist is a very very good approach combining spirituality with a uh, rationality so i'm very happy to be in this uh, to be hosted in this forum thank you bro yes i i do try to you could say rational present spirituality from a rational and practical perspective you phrased it quite nicely thank you so maybe we could start something with uh, uh, about your journey you know how did you um, come to maybe you can start briefly how you were introduced to uh, to bhagavad gita and how did you choose to focus on the bhagavad gita in your writing and in your teaching Well I I I was what you call the a seeker seeker of truth and I met the devotees when I was around the 19 years of age I was a soldier at that time sorry just and a, I, sorry just a, so but, you were born and brought up in Israel all the time yeah I I I'm Israeli born I was born here I was raised here I, in a secular uh, Zionist uh, family I I went to the army service and during the army I uh, I I I I I I met the devotees I started associating, and very, very quickly, I was very attracted to the Bhagavad Gita. Actually, I got a copy and I started translating it, just kind of for fun, from English to Hebrew. Uh, I really liked the Gita. I, I felt it's very something very uh, impressive, very big. So you, you and then when I finished it, my uh, what's that? You yourself were translating it. And that yeah, yeah. I, I I remember myself at the age of 19, just taking uh, a Gita. The the abridged version, if you remember, there were these abri- abridged versions, and I start just in my time translating from English to uh, Hebrew, uh, very like kind of age of nineteen, okay. and um, then later when I finished my service, I uh, joined uh, I joined the temple and um, I became a devotee, and uh, um, and and I studied the Gita, I mean as deeply as I could. it was a very deep experience i i i felt the gita i studied as, as a devotee uh, and that very very much uh, changed my life i have to say then around the age of 30 actually 32 almost 33 i went to school to university to do my uh, studies and i focused on indology uh, indian studies sanskrit indology uh, philosophy uh, and religious studies and, uh, and Which studies? Which studies? Religious theology, okay. religious studies, and okay. uh, that was that was my undergrad. And then my uh, masters, I focus on the Bhagavad Gita. I uh, decide to write my uh, dissertation, my MA dissertation on the Bhagavad Gita in Tel Aviv University uh, with uh, Professor Shlomo Biderman, who was my advisor. And I actually <clears throat> treated the Gita. as a philosophy i would say I, i i i actually looked at the gita as a philosophy and i remember my conversations with my advisor at that time as i mentioned biderman mm-hmm. and <clears throat> we were trying to compare the gita to plato uh, plato's philosophy plato's cave and things like that i mean there was a there was a, a, a the feeling at least i had that that um, the gita has a very deep uh, philosophy which uh, remains to be articulated and uh, so, I, so i remember my supervisor uh, saying to me see he said you're giving us a, a like a, a magnifying glass into the gita you're kind of opening the gita for us i i, I had it I, i had this inclination uh, i don't know 
uh, previous That's life, possible. yes or not, I don't know, but uh, it, it, it was a deep attraction, which I have to this very day, uh, to the Gita. That's beautiful. Uh, so that, 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 that became the focus of my uh, academic studies. Uh, at first, I want to teach the Gita at the university, which I did. Then I want to publish a, a Hebrew edition of translation and uh, commentary, which I did based upon my uh, master's uh, uh, dissertation. Okay. And then later that was uh, published in English uh, in the form of Exploring Bhagavad Gita Philosophy, Structure and Meaning, and yet done in, uh, in uh, Chinese and Russian and uh, Portuguese, and now there's another Chinese edition coming, but that's basically the way it went. Okay, amazing. So when you said you, you presented the Gita as a, you focus on the Gita as a philosophy, so how is the Gita seen in the mainstream world or in the academic world? Is it primarily seen as a religious text? Is it not seen as a philosophy in general? Well, the Gita in general is seen as an eclectic text of wisdom. I mean, everyone agrees that the Gita contains deep wisdom. That's, that there's no argument about that. Things which change your life, go into your heart, touches upon the deep truth of life. That, that, that's accepted. However, most scholars see that as a religious uh, text and also as eclectic. Eclectic means it has many ideas which are not tied together. There's no unifying structure. It's many ideas. Some say the Gita is the Hindu respond to Buddhism. That's another thing which people say about the Gita, uh, which has a grain of truth in it. I mean, you, you, you can see that argument and understand. But basically, I think my main innovation was treating the Gita as philosophy. I have a good friend, I have a friend, and uh, he's a philosopher. He was a lecturer in philosophy at the... Uh, Haifa University, later became the Israeli Minister of uh, Finance, went to politics. And you know, he knows me for many years as, as, through, with my Gita journey. And years ago, he told me, Itamar, he said, actually, your argument is that you have uh, discovered a philosophical text. You have discovered, that's what you're saying, Itamar, he said. He said, you know, if I try to uh, uh, condense your statement, your Mahavakya, your argument, that's what you're saying. You're saying you have discovered a new philosophical text. The Gita is not new, everyone knows the Gita, but to, to, to claim that the Gita is philosophy, that is a good, a, oh, a new innovative argument. And that's what you are saying. He told me years ago, and he was right. He was right in a sense, that is a, what I was saying. You know, a, if I can mention that, we Just have... One minute, Prabhu. I mean, this is a very yeah. significant point. So, when you are saying two things, it's eclectic and it's philosophy. So, when you're saying you treat it as a philosophy means that it's a, it's a, rational, it's a rational body of knowledge with a coherent message. Is that what exactly. you mean by the word philosophy? Yeah, by philosophy, I mean that it, ha it has a coherent structure, which is perhaps my main argument about the Gita. I have, I have my commentary where, where I explain each and every verse or section, but uh, beyond that, I have an argument about the structure. I call this structure the three stories house structure. Okay. Just, sorry, just one minute, before we go into that, I'm just uh, trying to, I'm curious to understand. So why, why is it not considered to be a philosophy? Because there are so many commentators that Acharya, various Acharyas have written. And generally within the tradition, at least uh, the Bhagavad Gita is seen as a philosophical text. Or are you saying that say each Acharya has their own philosophy and then they use the Bhagavad Gita to substantiate that philosophy? But it is not that the Bhagavad Gita itself has its own philosophy. Well, uh, I, I would say... say why, why is this an innovation for somebody who has lived in the tradition? We understand the Bhagavad Gita is a philosophical text. But uh, uh, yeah, let, let me try to, to, to answer, answer for different points of view. One point of view would be that for years, Indian philosophy was considered in Western terms. For example, okay. take Western terms, uh, logic, ep ep epistemology, ethics, 
aesthetics, mm. and then try to find the Indian counterpart. So you have academics working in the field of Indian philosophy, but that would be like logic, nyaya, uh, that would be, uh, 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 I mean, things like that. Uh, I mean, the famous BK Matilal was a professor in Oxford, mm. uh, professors such as uh, Jonathan Ganeri. I mean, you have academics looking at Indian uh, philosophy, but usually they will not treat the Gita as philosophy. Of course, the Gita is one of the Prasthana Trayi, one of the three uh, foundations of the Vedanta uh, tradition. This, this, this is known, but even, even there, it, seem, it, it looks low, it, 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 it usually treat more like a text of karma, yoga, and ethics rather than uh, philosophy, logic, uh, epistemology, uh, ontology, uh, and so forth. So that, that so that that would be one answer. One answer will be that uh, that uh, seen from Western a Western point of view, that's not exactly what philosophy looks like. Rather, okay. nyaya would be like serious philosophy, logic. Okay, that, so that, let, that, me that what you're, let me re rephrase what you're saying. So there are certain conceptions within the Western vision of what philosophy means. And how yes. a philosophy should be. So that's why yes. we have the six systems of philosophy. Like there is, as you said, Nyaya, there is Vaisheshika, there is, the, 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 in one some ways, systems of philosophy. But Vedanta. Yes, that, that's is, true. That's true. That's true. But then the Gita would have all of them, more or less. I mean, the Gita yes. would have each, Mimamsa. Each school I mean, of it, has, it has the Vedic uh, sacrificial ethos. It would have Vedanta very, very, very clearly, it would have Vedanta. It would yes. have much yoga, no doubt. It has yoga. It would have a. It will have sankhya. You have sankhya okay. in the Gita quite a bit. Uh, mm. Then you have some nyaya, a little nyaya. Krishna says, uh, in, "In logic, I am the conclusion." What is that verse? There is a mention of uh, of logic. Yeah. Uh, in the Gita. Vadha sanyatamaham. I think I, among the among the logicians, I am the perfect one. Thank you very much. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. And also, I would say you have a Sheshika, perhaps through Bumira Ponalova, you the elements. You could consider that the structure of matter. It's not like a very uh, developed, but you, you can look at this as, as some hint of a of matter of atomism. But uh, but certainly it has strong mimamsa, Vedanta, Yoga, and Sankhya. That's that's no doubt. But it's not clearly a text of one of them. They, it, 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 it speaks for all of them. Okay. But yeah. you yeah. cannot say that the Gita is a Mimamsaka text, a Prabhakar, a, a Mimamsa Sutra, things like that, or, or a Jaimini, a, a Prabhakar, and so forth. And, 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 and as Vedanta, we know it has various commentaries. You have Advaita, you have Vishishta, Advaita, Advaita, and so forth. So. So, so that, that's how the Gita is treated. I mean, it is considered philosophy uh, in some places. Uh, but good point. But, but still, most, most places you'll find the Gita as uh, representing Hinduism, as representing Hindu thought, eclectic, full of wisdom, but not as a hardcore philosophy. Okay, so this one question then: Are uh, and uh, parallelly, does the is the Bible set to have its own? Is the Bible seen as a philosophical book? Is the Quran seen as a philosophical book? Or no, no, no. Bible is not philosophy. Quran is not philosophy. That's preaching. It's sermons. I mean, Bible is sermons. That is taken, changing the heart. Again, the same thing. The Sermon on the Mount changes the heart, makes you a good person calls you to get closer to God, but it's not philosophy, perhaps theology, but uh, I don't think anyone, I mean, most people would not study uh, study the, the Bible uh, in the category of philosophy and Puranas, <laughs> they consider mythology, basically. Uh, I mean, the 19th century, 19th century definitions are still around. Purana equals mythology. That's 19th century, basically. 
no uh, okay uh, I, i didn't mean i sorry i didn't i didn't mean quran i mean quran I and mean, other religious texts ah you said you said quran not puran i thought yeah. it says purana yeah yeah quran I... now quran also is not philosophy quran is religion oh okay of course the quran is philosophy quran is religion uh, of course okay so you, you you have islamic philosophers but not but but they will be like uh, writing interpretations uh, maybe philosophers or uh, islamic philosophy or theology but that wouldn't be the the quran the quran will be the scripture and they will develop their own systems around that mm. so so we, if you consider philosophy as a systematically developed a body of thought then we could say the gita will contribute to that systematically developed body of thought but the gita itself is not seen as as having a systematically developed body of thought but what you have yeah, done is that, that that's the way the gita is seen, seen yeah, right, and okay. i i'm my 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 work i'm trying to highlight to prove to show that you can read the gita as a philosophy of course i'm offering an interpretation that's that's the way i view the gita i i organize it but yes the, that that is my uh, statement my innovation i'm saying here there is a real philosophical text interesting so so the implication here would be that so so practically speaking how would the approach or what would be the result if the gita is seen not as a religious text or as a philosophical text is it that it it acquires more intellectual respectability it goes beyond uh, sec- its reach goes beyond sectarian boundaries or how does it uh, make a difference let's 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 try to look at the greek what happened in greece like 2500 years ago you had in in ancient greek you had a uh, groups like the pythagorean followers of yeah. uh, pythagoras now they would live in what we call today in ashram setting Oh. they lived in ashrams they had a uh, dietary rules they were v- vegetarian they followed vows sometimes they had to uh, be quiet silent for 5 years monam 5 years in order to 5 years of monam in order to be accepted they had religious practices they would worship the greek gods the the goddess of wisdom they treated their knowledge uh, as mystical mathematics were treated as sacred knowledge it wasn't like today computerized and uh, secular it was sacred knowledge they felt that they were uh, doing mystic studies and that's how greek philosophy uh, developed and then uh, that's the pythagorean uh, then people were uh, some of them some of these groups were gathering in academos field there was a field Uh, an orchard actually by uh, by someone called academos and that's how the academy the this term academy uh, uh, came to light it happened and then you had you had plato he was part of that academy also they were initiated they were practicing religious uh, practices and that's basically what we would call today an ashram setting and gradually that tradition became secularized and it became separated from its religious background it happened about 2500 years ago and then there you have the whole story of the western tradition uh, you have the classical period the, the greek uh, and the romans then you had christianity they mixed together uh, and they built up the western civilization but the implications are huge once the gita is taken as philosophy i mean you can also read plato in aristotle as greek mystical writing just study greek classical writing but at a certain point once it became philosophy it became secularized it became universalized and it changed the the world actually i i can say we can say that this world is in in many ways thinking in greek terms mathematics i mean you're an engineer you study mathematics that's a greek a greek a, a branch of knowledge in many ways okay. and that allow so many things so so i, I so, so, so what, what you're saying is that let, let, let me just uh, just say so that happened some 25 years uh, 2500 years ago that this mystical knowledge uh, took the shape of philosophy and now these days you can go to a philosophy department you can study greek philosophy you don't have to take initiation into a greek uh, cult you don't have to be silent for 5 years you just study as philosophy 
So what I think is that what's happening now is that the Gita is in some ways following the same path 2,500 years later. I mean, you go to the ashram. Many people go from Israel, actually. They go to Rishikesh. They sit in an ashram and study the Gita in an ashram setting. And in a sense, what I'm doing, I'm taking the Gita out of the ashram setting and I'm universalizing it. I'm trying to secularize it and bring it as a universal uh, philosophy. And that happened already with the Greek philosophy a long time ago. And I think that it, it's happening now, not, not because of me, because of geo geopolitical shifts, the rise of Asia, 21st century, uh, all these things are happening. And Asia is becoming more prominent in the world, as I mentioned, a, a geopolitically, all these uh, changes, 21st century, rise of Asia. And in that, the Gita is occupying a much more a prominent a place. So to your original question, a once, once articulating a, the structure of the Gita, which is what I'm trying to do or arguing, I see it a, as a, a world, global philosophy, potentially global philosophy for various reasons, which I'll be happy to uh, discuss. But yeah. that is what I'm saying. I'm saying 21st century, uh, there are shifts, cultural shifts. There's the rise of India and China. Uh, there is uh, the rise of postmodernity, which uh, uh, you know my, my opinion is about. And in that, the Gita has a potential uh, to become the foundation of global ethics, global ethics. I mean, we have globalization, we have uh, the shifting of uh, uh, commodities and uh, finances and people, but we also need to have a, 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 a global ethical system. I mean, so many groups and everyone has different ethical ideas, and I think that the Gita has a potential there. And uh, yes, that's that's basically what I'm saying about the Gita. I'm trying to, uh, to uh, present it as a, a beneficial philosophy for 21st century, uh, which is, I mean, Basically, that's what I'm saying, yes. Hmm. This is fascinating. You've made a lot of points, and I think I'll, we'll have to unpack them a little bit. So no rush. now, I, I, had, I have read Plato and Socrates and uh, Aristotle, but uh, as you rightly pointed out, in, when reading about them, we hardly read anything about what gods they believed in or what gods they worshipped. So when we approach them, we approach them as philosophers. So what you're saying is that they were, they, they had the religious dimension to their life. And yes, was, of course. But, but that, because if that, that had become their defining identity, then who wants, in today's world, who wants to commit to a particular religion? It's not yes, just... Yes, exactly. Country. Exactly. These, these days, you can go and study Greek philosophy without mm -hmm. worshipping uh, Athens, okay. the goddess uh, Athena. You don't have to worship her. You don't have to sacrifice, a, I don't know, a chicken or I don't know what they were doing. You don't have to do any vows. It's 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 uh, considered to be secularized. So, no, so, no, okay. no one says, "Oh, now you're a Greek. Now you're a, uh, you're practicing Greek religion." Uh, the separation of Greek philosophy with a Greek practice, and it happened. It actually happened and changed the world. So, so it becomes that you you create space for. Uh, intellectual exploration without demanding, say, religious affiliation or religious exactly. conversion. Exactly. And I'm that, saying a, here is a good philosophy. Okay. I'm saying here's the good philosophy. You can you can study the Gita. You can uh, live the Gita. And of course, the Gita will ultimately change you. I mean, once you accept yeah, it, as, as the Gita, uh, as the Greek philosophy changed us in many ways and made us all Greek. Uh, in some ways, I mean, we have become Greek in, 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 in not in our religion, but in our giving mathematics importance and in our epistemology, ontology. I mean, all these things happen unknowingly. Yeah, I, I think it's like it's in the intellectual DNA of modern humanity. You could say. That. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There. Exactly. True. But I, 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 as you am saying, I am saying you can study the Gita without <laughs> taking initiation without being committed to religious principles and so forth, but as as as, as a good uh, text, which is a good philosophy. So so that's interesting. Now, when you're later talking about say Christianity, see even Newton was quite a committed uh, Christian, and he did a lot of writings on trying to 
explain Christianity in empirical terms and try to do Bible dating. But that aspect of Newton is not what not what is highlighted. Newton is prominently yeah. known as a scientist. So yes. for his scientific contributions. So basically, if we consider, say, the wisdom of the Gita to be like a like a temple, then you are opening like a big new door for people to come in. Like traditionally, yes. the door was the door was the you you become, you worship, you join a particular tradition, worship the Lord, and then that's how you come in. Well, uh, if I may mention something about Shri Prabhupada, hmm. uh, there was a statement that Shri Prabhupada built a house for the whole world to live in. Hmm. It said about Shri Prabhupada that he built a house for the whole world. Now, where's that house? I mean, can the whole world, nine billion people, enter a, a temple? A, a preaching center were. And I'm taking that and I'm saying that the Gita, this three-story house, is a house uh, which can accommodate the whole world and um, accommodate various religions, various philosophies, give them all space within the structure of the Gita uh, in, in a way which will unify them and elevate them, take them into a progressive ethical and spiritual path um, regardless of their uh, culture, religion, uh, beliefs, and so forth. Really, that's a remarkable play, claim. So what? You, so now, uh, so the so what you're saying is that the Gita can be appreciated by people irrespective of their religious affiliations. That it yes. can accommodate everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we, didn't, we didn't bring it to this uh, conversation for discussion, but I did publish in India a, a cha book chapter called uh, The Bhagavad Gita as an All Indian Text. And in that uh, book chapter, which was published a year or two ago, uh, I described the Gita and tried to show how it is uh, compatible with the uh, nine Indian religions. Of course, Hinduism, of course, the Gita, I didn't even uh, mention because the Gita is considered Hindu. But I, I do mention Buddhism and bring some verses which, to my mind, are close to Buddhism. Uh, I do mention Jainism. I mean, not very difficult to find Jain ideas in the Gita. I do uh, mention Sikh tradition, find devotional about the Guru, about uh, various ideas. Uh, I mention Christianity. Uh, and I, 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 I bring verses from the Gita, which to my mind are compatible with Christianity. I mentioned Islam. Yes, also Islam. And I, I bring some verses. And actually, I bring a chapter from the Gita, uh, which I feel uh, resembles the religious feeling of Islam. Chapter 11. It's another question, another discussion. And also Judaism, where I make uh, the connection of, of Dharma and uh, Halakha, the Jewish law. Hmm. Uh, I bring uh, the Zoroastrian uh, idea and I bring various ideas about the elements, dualism, uh, and, and, and uh, of course, fire, Vedic fire altars and things like that. And I bring the Baha'is and bring various ideas, such as the Avatar idea, uh, to be close to Baha'i ideas. So I do, I do have a paper, a chapter, about trying to see the Gita as an old Indian book and how the Gita is compatible with all these nine uh, central regions, which all uh, are there in India, uh, of course, yeah. That's fascinating. So yeah, I think you sent me that paper and I read it also. So, so I didn't think of that in this framework. Now, each of these religions will have their own their own, you could say, philosophy built around it and their own uh, their own systems of practice and other things. Yeah. So are we saying that all of them have some elements that are compatible with the Gita? Or yes. all of all of them within if we consider the Gita's philosophy, Gita's worldview, there is space to accommodate all of them. Yes, yes. And I, I think I think some of the space is allowed by the application of the Guna doctrine, which is basically secular. The Guna mm. uh, idea of Sankhya is at the foundation of the Gita, at the, at the base of the Gita, and that allows an expansion uh, through a secular idea. The Guna, the way I take the Gunas is non-religious. 
I mean, you can think in terms of the gunas in whatever religion, whatever religion you practice. You can think about the gunas, and basically the principle is elevation, uh, trying to climb up the position within the gunas. And once once this idea is accepted, uh, then many religions can be practiced. You want to practice Judaism, so try to practice Judaism, uh, not in Tamas, but in Rajas, and not in Rajas, but in Sattva. Uh, that, 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 that it works, and, uh, and, and people find common language because all these religions, they have these ideas of becoming a better person, uh, which basically uh, goes to, to be more and more sattvic. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mention the larger Asia, I just mentioned India, but they also have a paper about the Gita, it's an old Asian uh, book, and to that I add two more religions, one is Confucianism and one is uh, Taoism, and I make the connections there. I mean, Confucianism would uh, would would very much would like to see the gentleman, the Junze, the ideal person, as the peop- as the person in Sattva Guna. But that's a, a different direction. But it's there, and I develop it elsewhere. Uh, that direction between Chinese uh, philosophy, ethics, Junze, and the Bhagavad Gita. Mm, that's beautiful. So mm, now. This is uh, the I, I read your book and you talk about a three level presentation of the Gita, but I'm not sure whether this point of the Gita as a world philosophy it, it didn't come out so prominently it, through the book, or is it something which you are also developing uh, as you are moving forward? Because this paper makes it much more clearer. So, how has been the reception to the idea that the Gita could be a potential? world philosophy or world unifying philosophy? Oh. Well, I published this book, uh, Exploring Bhagavad Gita Philosophy, Structure and Meaning, back in 2010. It was published by Ashgate, a good uh, academic publisher in the UK. Uh, and it gained very good uh, uh, reception very quickly. It received the choice, outstanding title for, uh, uh, for, ex- for, for, for excellent books, which is a very prestigious award uh, given by the uh, American Association of Academic Libraries. They give the, they award this to one to 40, two and a half percent of new publications in the 56 uh, disciplines. And the book uh, received that award without me having any connections with anyone. I, I, I wasn't even aware of that, that the book was judged in there and they, they gave them. Now it received very good reviews and a few good reviews. Uh, it received a review in the Journal of Hindu Studies, one of probably the best, uh, one of the best, or if not the best, uh, uh, Journal of Hindu Studies, uh, Oxford University Press. And there it was said that uh, it's very difficult to break new grounds in the study of the Gita, but um, I've done it, that uh, I I have broken uh, new grounds. And it ends with a statement that future scholars who will not refer to this will be deficient in their scholarship. I mean, that's what they wrote. Uh, and then there was another review uh, by Professor Arvind Sharma, very famous Gita scholar, uh, mm-hmm. probably you know him. And he, that was in another excellent uh, journal, International Journal of Hindu Studies, the second excellent, uh, I would say the second, that, that these, these are the two leading uh, 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 journals of Hindu studies. And there, uh, there was this review by uh, Professor Sharma, who wrote that... Uh, most most uh, Gita commentaries are not philosophical, but uh, my own commentary is philosophical, which is uh, unique and uh, special. Uh, there was another review by uh, uh, Hamza Stanton in Philosophy East and West, and he wrote that actually I wrote two books. One book is my Gita commentary. I actually offer a commentary in the text, but the second one is my argument about the structure, which is something else. So we have two books in one, he said. So that was another uh, 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 important uh, uh, review. And then, then uh, Ashgate was acquired by Routledge. Routledge is this huge international uh, publisher, yeah. academic publisher. So Routledge acquired uh, uh, Ashgate because one company uh, 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 buys another sometimes. And then I became a Routledge author. And then Routledge decided to publish this in India a soft cover, which was done two or three years ago, I think 19, 2019. 
So now the same book is in the West uh, and also in India with an Indian edition, Indian price. So I think it was received well. I mean, That's published both in the West and India and got uh, good uh, reviews. Uh, yeah, I think I think today I, I, I there's there's a PhD student uh, in Oxford right now who just wrote an article uh, basically accepting my interpretation of the three-story house and taking it as a point of departure for further development. Uh, I, I'm in touch with him, uh, which is quite, I mean, quite good. I mean, someone takes your ideas and think, okay, let's accept that as a point of departure for an Oxford dissertation and or article, I'm not sure where it went exactly, and develops that into a further argument, takes it further uh, into details. So uh, yes, I think I think it was received uh, received well, and I think that my Gita now is one of the I don't know leading editions, but it is it is it is one of the editions which some scholars refer to. Let's let's try to not uh, go too far, but you you do have some serious. A, a papers on the Gita which quote my edition. Let's let's leave it there. It it, mm. it has occupied a place among uh, among Gita editions. Uh, yeah, people are happy with it. Let's let's leave it like that. Mm. Not be carried That's away. So, so overall, how uh, it's now in the academic world to actually, as you said, the kind of compliments you have got, appreciation you have got, that is remarkable. And uh, how has the response been in the devotee community? Have you tried to publicize it in the devotee community, or that is not your primary target audience? So there well, is more organic. Well, well, I am very happy to say that uh, the devotee community very much likes this book. Uh, it just, it just true. Uh, my other book on the Bhagavata Purana, the Shrimad Bhagavatam, I think was different. But in my Gita book, the devotee community liked it. Uh, first, uh, there was the uh, uh, Russian GBC, Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj. Uh, he, he, he was aware of the book and he said, he asked ISKCON Russia to do it in Russian. Okay. So that was actually, uh, they invited me uh, to the court case. There was a court case against the Gita, Parapas Gita, yes, some yes. eight years ago. So I couldn't come, but I would have come if I could. It was just, uh, anyhow, just for some practical reasons. But I, I said I supported, and he said, "Why don't we uh, do this? Your Gita in a, in a Russian, which the devotees did. We worked together. They acquired the, the, the they acquired the, uh, the rights from Rotledge. Everything was done properly." And the Gita is now published by ISKCON in Russia and distributed to libraries, my, my, mean my work. And that was encouraged by the GBC at the time, Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj. So uh, that's the Russian edition. Now in uh, Brazil, in Brazil, devotees uh, also wanted my uh, edition. And just now it happened, just uh, it, uh, we, we did a lot of work and uh, that was translated into uh, Portuguese and uh, published by a leading academic press called Voses just about a month ago. And actually, I was supposed to have an inaugural speech on the, uh, through Zoom, uh, a promotion speech, just tomorrow evening, uh, me in Israel speaking to a Brazil, Brazilian audience uh, in English translating to Portuguese, but they asked me to to postpone it to later this month. So we're talking now about inauguration of uh, of uh, uh, the book in uh, in Brazil, promoted by devotees. That's my point. And then in uh, China, it was done also by devotees. Uh, and there's a Chinese edition. And right now, there's another uh, edition being done by Chinese devotees because they felt that the other the other edition wasn't clear enough. The language was too high and they want something more uh, uh, accessible. So I'm in touch with a, a certain Chinese devotee lady. Uh, we're corresponding. We were supposed to meet on Zoom just two days ago, three days ago. 
and we just made another meeting for the for the later this month to discuss some questions of the translation. But the point is that ISKCON China also wants to have this uh, as uh, a, a, another edition. So we're talking now about a, a, a Russian edition with ISKCON in, in Russia. We're talking about a, a, a Portuguese promoted by ISKCON scholars in, 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 in Portugal, in, in Brazil, and two editions in China, all one done by devotees and one in, in the making. So the, the, the conclusion is that the devotees like the text. The devotees like it. They feel that the text is devotional. It's not. Uh, it's not theoretical. They feel that it's it's a good it's a good uh, apparently. Otherwise, they would have not uh, read it. So I think the devotees like it. Uh, I'm intellectualizing the Gita. It's true. I am intellectualizing, but uh, I think the devotees still like it. Yeah. That's and I'm very happy about it because I wanted it to serve uh, the devotees to serve Shila Prabhupada. And a, to serve as a bridge, I would say. Perhaps that's, that's what a bridge a, to the more academic, a, more, a, I don't know, secular a, world. True. So this is remarkable. There are quite a lot, number, lot of devotees are appreciating it. And um, so, so you talk, talk several times about the three level structure. Can you explain that a little bit? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, as I mentioned, the core of my argument. I would say that in order to see the three-story house structure, uh, we will have to divide it into two parts. One part is the three stories, and the other part is the staircase or the ladder. Now, the three, the three stories is a division of the Bhagavad Gita into three different metaphysical layers. I'm trying to say that the Gita is a practicing what you call hierarchical reality. That's a basic concept in Indian philosophy. In Indian philosophy, you have basically the direct realistic position where we all share the same reality, but you also have the hierarchical a, a position where a reality is divided into slots, into parts. And what one, one person sees is not what the other person sees. We know it from Vedanta. We know it from Buddhism. I mean, a, a absolute reality and a contingent reality. We have these terms a, of a absolute and, a, and contingent. And basically, I'm saying that in the Gita, we have three levels. One level is the level of, uh, I call it the word of Dharma, the humanistic level. And the second one is the uh, level of yoga. I call it the spiritualistic level. And the third one is the uh, absolute level, the level of moksha, pure devotion, moksha, whatever. Now, in the first level, we have uh, the human being. The human being is the term. We are people, we are persons, men, women, uh, with material identities. And that's the language, the basic language is the humanistic language. That's basically the Vedic language of offering sacrifice and uh, aspiring to prosper in the world, be happy, healthy, religious, uh, go to higher planets, uh, secure, cultured, uh, so that's that would be uh, the first level. So in this first level, which is uh, which contains a whole terminology, a whole terminology. In that first level, uh, the subject means we are human beings, men, women, and so forth. And uh, the ethics is to prosper, to be healthy, Om Shanti, and so forth. And the ontology is that we are uh, human beings. Now, the last, the last, the, 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 the highest, the highest point, I don't discuss so much with that in the Gita, the moksha part, that's a completely different liberated state that's up there in the spiritual world. Uh, it's a different discussion, which is not so much in the Gita, there are hints about that. But it's there. The, the, I mean, in, in, in devotional terms, we consider ourselves to be servants of God and enjoy rasas, serve Krishna in a spiritual world, or if you want to go to Advaita Vedanta, then that will be one with Brahman, but let's leave it aside, it's not so important for us. 
And the second level is a level of in-between. So just wait one minute. I mean, this is a lot of things. The three levels, let me understand them clearly. So using the terms as dharma, yoga, and moksha. Yeah. And dharma is the humanistic level. Yes. So I was just thinking, which are the verses in the Gita which talk about the humanistic level? It's something like 231 to 237 where he says that if you fight and win, you will attain heaven. If you fight and win, you will attain exactly. heaven. Exactly. This is, this, is, this is very clearly first floor. This is very clear, yeah. So okay. you're right. So, 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 so uh, the yoga level is in between. Now, the yoga level <coughs> the, uh, is different. In the yoga level, we're no longer human beings, but our ontology is different. We're spirit souls. In samsara, it's a different terminology altogether. And also the ethics change. In the first level, the humanistic level, uh, we aspire for prosperity. But in the second level, the yogic level, our ethics is to be uh, equal-minded towards happiness and distress, loss and gain and so forth. It's completely different ethics. Now, Beautiful. I can change. Yeah, I think Thank this you. happens this, to, from 237. To 238, 239, there's a radical change. You're yeah, right. It's a radical change. Exactly there. Sukha dukha, same kritva, laba laba, jayo jayo, tato yudhaiva, yudhisva, naivam, papam, vasi. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. So, so, uh, and that, that's, that's what's happening. That's the story of the Gita. So Arjuna speaks the whole first chapter from the first level. He says, I don't want to kill them. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be sin, papa. And we're going to go against Dharma, and I'm going to kill uh, my parents and and and, and uh, my, my my kids and so forth. That's all first uh, floor arguments. Now, when, when Krishna answers Arjuna, he does he doesn't answer him directly. Rather, he starts by what I call the Copernican revolution. He goes up to the second floor. Okay. Arjuna says, "Oh, and so much sin and this and that." Krishna says, death, I don't see any death. No one seems to be dying here. They're all alive eternally. All these kings are alive. The Hinus Minata, the and so forth, the spirit soul is eternal. He's speaking from the second level. Arjuna speaks from the first level. I don't want to, uh, and Krishna Speaks second level. He says, I, I see only spirit, soul, and samsara. I don't see anyone dying. And actually, he says, I don't see the need for prosperity because these yogis are matras, pashas, tukuntaya. They aspire to tolerate, not to enjoy the world, but to be equal-minded. So that's, that's, the, that's the Gita. Then he goes down, as you mentioned in, the, in these verses, he goes down, happy the kshatriyas, eh, 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 where svarga, dvarma, pavrita, and all that. That, go, that goes down, and then he builds the ladder. But you have to recognize a different language in the Gita. And once you see that the Gita has these levels, the Gita starts to make sense. Then it works out. Hmm. Then you see, now we're talking first story. Now, even me, I can talk with you now first story. Uh, Hari Bol, I'm uh, Ishvar Krishna Das, or Ithamar Theodore, and I, I live in Israel, I live in Amirim. It's all true. I'm not lying. I'm saying the truth. I, I live in Amirim. I'm an Israeli. Uh, I, I, I joined this, called this and that. It's all, it's all truth. Now I can shift to the second floor. I'm not Ishvar Krishna. I'm not Theodore. I'm not in Amirim. I'm a spirit soul. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm being tossed in the ways of samsara. I don't know exactly what I'm doing here. And it's also true. It's just a different language. I can say that because it's a different point of view, which is there in the Gita. Of course, it's there in classical Indian philosophy. You have the yoga school and so forth. But in the Gita, you have it very clearly. So that's these two languages. I'm putting aside a third language. It's not so important for me now. It's basically, the Gita focuses about these two languages. In my work on the Bhagavatam, I would deal more with the third language. But now there are these two. So there is a... Gulf of difference between them, and once you accept the principle of hierarchical reality, which is the basic principle of Indian philosophy, the Vedanta tradition, it's there. Uh, then you can see that the Gita goes into steps or tiers or stories, and you have to know uh, the point of view where you're talking. 
If I say I'm a Theodore Ishvara living Amirim, I'm not lying. I'm saying the truth, but it is from the humanistic point of view. And now I'm saying I'm not Ishvara. I'm not this body. I have nothing to do with this world. I'm a spirit soul. I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, apparently my karma took me here. That's a different language. It's a different set of values there. So, so I mean, this is quite fascinating. I just think of so many Gita verses, which can be almost every Gita verse, we can analyze from which framework it is, from which level it is exactly. spoken. So does yes. Krishna actually affirm the first level? In one sense, Krishna, it's you could say that it's like the Purva Paksha, Arjuna is presenting the first level and Ar Krishna is in one sense, is Krishna acknowledging the first level or Krishna is saying the first level level is in illusory and go beyond it. So can Krishna, we Krishna, Krishna, he answers Arjuna's questions very systematically. In the, in the first, in the first chapter, Arjuna basically, to my mind, presents four arguments against fighting. The first one is the utilitarian uh, argument, which has two uh, divisions, I can explain. The second one is the uh, Dharma, uh, uh, Dharma argument. The third one is the Papa, the sin argument. And the fourth one is the relinquishment argument. And I can, I, 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 I can explain, uh, basically, I can expand that. And, and then if you see the Gita, Krishna answers all these arguments one by one, systematically. Everything is answered. These verses in the second chapter, which you mentioned about the Kshatriya is going to heaven, that's, answer, that's an answer into the first argument. It's all, everything is in place. You can see the Gita and it's structured. And surprisingly, my students who are not devotees, they understand that. They write examinations about that. They understand the structure of the Gita. They write their exams on this, explain the arguments, explain the answers to the arguments. It works. But with your permission, I'd like to address the other component, which is the ladder. So uh, okay, we, so we know... First is the levels. What's that? The, the, you, you have the, the three the levels. levels. And then yeah, you have a ladder levels. between the levels. The ladder yeah, yeah. I mean, from the you, ha you, you have a three-story house. How do you move between them? How do you go from the first one to the second one? Okay. So here I'm applying, I'm applying a traditional Vaishnava idea. It's not my idea. The, this is the idea which I read, I, I learned Sorry. first. If you don't mind, just one minute, I would like to make a point before we move forward. Now, I was thinking about uh, that Krishna is not actually rejecting the first level also. He's acknowledging, but he's contextualizing, isn't it? Because so Krishna says, Dehi no nita dehe, but in the next verse itself, he refers to Arjuna as Partha. He refers to Arjuna as Kaunte, son of Kunti, son of, son of Prutha. So, Bharat Arshabha. So, in that sense, uh, when, she, when she, she, Prabhupada would say, you are not the body. But then Prabhupada would also say, you know, what, when he was asked, why do you, why is your accent so thick? Prabhupada says, I am a Bengali. My body is Bengali. I am Bengali. You are Americans. So, the humanistic identity is, cannot be rejected. In one no, sense. no, no, no. They lean on each other. They lean on each other. That's you have to have to understand Indian thought, Indian philosophy. They coexist. They coexist, and we move back and forth all the time. We move back and forth all the time. One, I mean, if 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 you if you see the structure of the Gita, and maybe I'll come to that later, you yeah. will see that the whole structure enforces Dharma, but from different points of view. But it's always enforcing dharma. I mean, the, the message of the Gita is, is be dharmic, but raise your consciousness. But let, let me come to that gradually. So, okay. so about the ladder. The ladder, this is a traditional Vaishnava idea. I, I first learned that in VIHE, in Vrindavan, basically from Burijan Prabhu. That was in 91, 1991. I, in Gorpunim, Gorpunim in 91, I, I studied there and learned that from Burijan Prabhu. And that very much impressed me. And uh, later I discussed that with him. And he said, why don't you go to look for a, a, a Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's uh, Gita commentary? It's there, which I did. And uh, I, I found a translation by Banu Swami. And it, it seems this is the source that uh, uh, Shula Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he 
he writes his commentary based upon this idea of a refinement. Now, in the yoga tradition, you have the famous yoga ladder of Patanjali. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. That's very famous. Hmm. Now, the Gita offers a similar ladder of karma yoga. A similar ladder of karma yoga. And you don't even have to argue too, too, diff uh, too much to get that because it's just there in the 12th chapter. If you look at chapter 12, hmm. you have the ladder in a descending form going from up to down. This is the second part of the, the last part of the, of the 12th chapter. Yeah, 12.8 to 12. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You go, you have the ladder. So it's there in the Gita. You don't even have to make too much of an argument, but it's there. So basically, uh, I adjust the ladder uh, to the three-story house. And I show that you have the lower stage, which is the utilitarian stage. Basically, if you mention these verses like, uh, uh, people will think of you as coward, and for one who has been honored, this honor is worse than death. This is the lowest uh, argument, the lowest stage of the ladder, utilitarian. Just talking about to Krishna, uh, to Arjuna in, in the utilitarian terms. Then you have the, the second one, which is also utilitarian. Arjuna says, I will go to hell, to, to Naraka. And Krishna says, no, you will go to Svarga if you die in the battle. Because happy are the Kshatriyas to whom such fighting opportunities. That's a second level, a slightly higher. And then you have the third level, which is in the border between the first and second levels. And that's the Sukha Dukha Samekritva and Karmani Eva Dikaraste, working without a, a desire for the fruits of action. So you're talking That's about, sorry, is it like Sakam Karma, Nishkam Karma and Karma Yoga? Or those terms may not exactly apply? Well, perhaps we have to discuss a, what I'm calling Karma Yoga. Basically, actually I gave, I gave, a, I, I, I gave a talk about uh, in, in the last Sanskrit, World Sanskrit Conference saying that Karma Yoga is actually Dharma Yoga. Karma yoga is dharma yoga. That was my argument that in analyzing the Gita, when we talk about karma yoga, we actually talk about following one's dharma in terms of varna, ashrama, dharma. Hmm. That's a good point. So this, is, this, is the, this is the karma. The karma is following one's dharma. Your duty, my duty, and these, the, the duty is in terms of varna, means brahmin, chatra, vasya, and shudra, and in terms of a, of ashram, brahmachari, grihastha, vanaprastha, sannyas. That's these two, uh, these four and four uh, designate uh, one's dharma, one's uh, duty. And now when this turns into yoga, it becomes karma yoga. And that happens in the conjecture between the first and second uh, levels. That's again, these verses, sukha dukha uh, samekritva, and 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 karmani eva di okay. so we have we have we have a structure here where krishna uh, convinces or preaches to arjuna mm. to follow his dharma and that structure remains all through the gita but okay. krishna is urging arjuna to uh, purify his motivation to sublimate his motivation. Do your dharma, but go upper and upper. Do your dharma. Stay a brahmacharya or grihasta or brahmin. Don't renounce your dharma, but sublimate it. Change your consciousness. Go up and up and up. And then Krishna says, why don't you do it for the sake of the highest good? You know, second chapter, the one who has a, a, a flood that doesn't need a well. Where there's a now flood, you don't need water. Yeah. And then Krishna says, Yoga Karma Sukhaushalam. Why don't you practice your Dharma as yoga? Very interesting idea. Very interesting that you practice your Dharma, your Varna Ashrama Dharma as a form of yoga, which means a mother can take care of her child as a yoga, mm -hmm. as yoga. Be a yogini and do it i.e. control her mind, uh, reduce her desires, practice yama niyama 
You can give your classes as a scholar, as a form of yoga. And that, that's, that's, that, that's, that's a very interesting state where dharma becomes yoga. And then when it goes higher, it gradually turns into bhakti. This is the peak of the Gita. You go upper. At first, you have bhakti according to your tendency. Yad karoshi, yad ashnasi, yad juhoshi, yad asiyat, and so forth. Means work for Krishna according to your capacity. If you're a carpenter, build an altar for Krishna. If you're a driver, drive Krishna, and so forth. Mm. And then it goes upper to a manmana, vamad bhakto, and so forth, be a pure devotee, go beyond material designations, do your spontaneous devotion, surrender unto Krishna, Charama Shloka, Sarva Dharma, Paritya and so forth. But it is all within the framework of Dharma. All these stages, all these stages are externally the same. In all these stages, Arjuna is urged to follow his Dharma and fight. The, uh, the journey is internal. The journey is internal from this humanistic level of thinking myself as a human being all the way up to a lover of Krishna, of Sarvadana Paritya Jaya, and various stages in, in the middle. But externally, it is the same. And that's why the Gita can stabilize the world, because it adheres to Dharma in every, in all stages. And oh, so it, when you say therefore, the world, sorry. Stabilize the world means that it, says, it can no bring the world. whole. It, it can bring the whole world uh, into a framework, a dharmic framework, where everyone. I mean, if you take dharma in the very wide uh, sense of all religions are dharma and this and that, everyone lives within their dharmic duties, whatever religion they are. But all try to sublimate. Uh, purify their existence, go up and up the, 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 the ladder, turn their attention up, uh, go upper and upper towards a, a more sublimated state of uh, existence. Hmm. That's basically how I see the Gita. So, so you, then, by any chance, if, just one minute, by any chance, have what? you depicted this three levels and the ladder dramatic, uh, diagrammatically in, anywhere? If yeah, I can show you. If you, if you like, I have it on a slideshow. I show it to students. Uh, so, can I, I, I can share a screen and show you if yeah, you like. Yeah, that would be nice. Then things will become clearer for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is in Hebrew. But this, this is actually, I took the Sheldonian Theater. I was studying in Oxford at that time. So I took the famous Sheldonian Theater as an example. And this is the first part called the World of Dharma. This is the second part. And actually, this small part is called the gods. I mean, that's the traditional name. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, this is the ladder. Hmm. A simple uh, utilitarianism, dharmic utilitarianism, duty for its own sake. This is karmani eva dikaraste, action for the highest good, yogic action and devotional action, which can also be divided. And uh, this is how they correspond. Now it's upside down. This is the first tier, simple, dharmic, duty for its own sake. Here's somewhere offering the fruits to the supreme good, turning ethical action into yoga, and up, unalloyed, spontaneous, and pure devotion. So it's interesting. Uh, offering fruits for the supreme good, you are putting that in the first tier. That is not the third tier. No, no, no. It's a second, it's a second tier already. Okay, but uh, this is this is this is a stage where someone does, I mean, Mother Teresa, people who gave their life for the world, for the public, uh, for for a good a good cause in general. It's not focusing on Krishna directly, but mm. it's a stage where someone is above one's uh, egoistic tendencies and opens oneself to the whole world or to to, to highest good, whatever they consider to be a highest good. Okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, here, so so the aspiration is lofty, but the conception of the ultimate uh, divinity or the ultimate reality may not be that clear at this point. Yeah, yeah, the ultimate uh, uh, divinity is up there. Okay. Uh, it can be different, different uh, concepts. 
uh, of course, in the Gita, that's Krishna. Uh, he's the highest. But 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 in 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 translating the Gita to a wide universalistic uh, audience, I would say whatever concept of divinity is there could be accepted, uh, whether one is this religion or that religion. Uh, yeah. We will not inform. I mean, the, the, the structure allows the focusing uh, of attention uh, towards divinity in a more general way. So how do you differentiate between simple utilitarianism and dharmic utilitarianism? Well, dharmic utilitarianism um, assumes next life, Svarga and Naraka. And when Arjuna says that if I do that, I will go to hell, to Naraka, Krishna answers, no, you will go to Svarga. Now, simple utilitarianism is without that. It's just calculating what is for my benefit. Arjuna says, basically, that's the lowest state in the Gita. Arjuna says, well, if I will go to war, I lose. Because if I lose, I lose. And if I win, this means my family will be dead. I'm going to lose my relatives. So I I'll, I'll lose too. What kind of a victory is that where your family dies? There's no one to celebrate the victory. That's the lowest, uh, that's the lowest argument. Uh, and Krishna answers, uh, <clears throat> no, uh, you will win. Because if you will win, you will win. <clears throat> and if you will avoid the battle, you will be considered a coward. And for someone like you, with your sense of honor and dignity, to be considered a coward is worse than death. This is the lowest uh, argumentation. But Krishna takes the trouble and goes there. <clears throat> but the, and then, then the next argument, Arjuna says, I'll go to hell. Which says, says, no, <clears throat> you, you want to calculate hell and heaven, you'll go to heaven, to Svarga, because the doors of heaven will open oh, for Kshatriyas okay. who, 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 who fight the army wars. But then here we start going into more spiritual uh, uh, discussions. Krishna says, why don't you turn your fighting into, into yoga? So Just like in yoga, you practice it uh, in a state of equal mindness. Why don't you... Do your, uh, your, 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 your fighting uh, as a type of yoga. Karmani, Eva, Dikaraste, give up the fruits of actions. Duty for its own sake. Now, this is also close to Confucianism. Confucianism has a similar idea of rejecting utilitarianism and acting out of pure duty. Here you, here you go into an Asian uh, 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 resemblance. And now here you go to a... Offering the fruits for the highest good. Do that as a, a service because this is the best thing to do. That's the well and the water which you mentioned. Okay. And then this is yoga, turning ethical action into yoga. Yoga karma su koshalam. This so, is... So that means, just a minute, that here 247, 246, 249, you're placing all of them at different levels. Like to, uh, so Basically here. That's this. Yeah, yeah. this They're this. all here. There are different levels in okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. at least. Now yoga, there's there's a, a, a similar idea with a Zen, a Zen Buddhist, Zen Buddhism. This, uh, and actually there are many Zen stories, various Zen stories about people uh, reaching perfection, enlightenment through archery. If you know these stories, people went to uh, the guru and they practiced archery and then they became enlightened. And they were able to, uh, to, to hit the target. There are various Japanese gen stories in this slide, which, uh, which uh, connect uh, fighting, especially archery, just like Arjuna, and, mm. uh, and enlightenment. And so here, Krishna says, go, go to the battle and do yoga. Which yoga? Not Ashtanga yoga, but fighting yoga. Send your arrows as a form of yoga. Concentrate your mind. Uh, if you want, purify your mind, just like a yogi. Just like a yogi who is doing asana, concentrating, getting a mystical vision, uh, detaching the senses from their objects. So fight in this manner. Fight like a mystic yogi, just like in Zen Buddhism. It's very interesting, this idea. It's very interesting. And you can expand that. You can, you can take it all all areas of life. You can be a bus driver, yogi, and go to work, drive your bus, and try to 
a meditator that you're doing yoga, trying to drive the bus smoother and to, to concentrate, to purify your mind, to gain a mystical vision, and you're going to be a better driver. A better driver. Every day doing a, a, a biasa, a continued practice. Every day doing your bus driving better. So you're saying this is a yoga karma su kaushalam, that level. Yes. Turning it. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. And then when and and from all that all that where it leads it leads to devotion. This is the peak of the Bhagavad Gita. It's devotion. Mm. And then this karma yoga turns into bhakti yoga, and you start doing your service to Krishna. Try to see the supreme and coming close and close to Krishna. As I mentioned before, first doing the service uh, as uh, w- within my tendencies, uh, still constrained by my nature to some degree, and then gradually coming to pure devotion, to unalloyed devotion, uh, going by Yona and our nature, and just serving Krishna because that's what Krishna uh, wants. As Krishna has just become an instrument in my hand. Uh, it's there in the uh, 11th chapter. Uh, consider that we are instruments in Krishna's acting and we are just instruments. But the interesting thing is all these stages all adhere to Dharma. There's no stage where Krishna says, okay, don't go to renounce the, the, renounce, the, renounce the war, renounce Dharma, you can go now. No, all these stages, all these stages send Arjuna to adhere to his Dharma. Now, you can ask, but if Arjuna is self-realized, why does he need to adhere to his dharma? So for this, you have a discussion in the third chapter about this exactly. Hmm. So Krishna was, says, one, 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 who is free, one who is enlightened is free from dharma. And then Krishna says, and apparently Arjuna says, what about if I, if I gain enlightenment, will I be free from this battle? And Krishna says, no, look at himself, he says. He says, take myself, Krishna, as an example. He says, I am free from the karma. I don't need to do dharma, but I do it as an example uh, for the whole world to follow. I do it. As an so even that point, Krishna uh, uh, covers and says, yad, yad, acharati, shrestas, and, and so forth, yeah. that even if you have reached that, and you don't need to follow it. You're yourself realized. So what will you do? Go to the beach? No, you will still follow Dharma, but from a higher motive to give example to the general populace, to, to lead people on the right path. Uh, but still, so that is perhaps one of the unique features of the Gita is that it adheres to Dharma all the way from down to up. All the way it's Dharmic. But the journey is internal. It's an internal journey, internal spiritual journey throughout one's dharma. And this is the special karma yoga leading to bhakti yoga ladder in the Gita and in the mean way, in the way shifting from the first tier to the second one, going upper and upper and thinking in higher and higher terms. You can call it mystical terms. But the direction is to become more dharmic more detached from this world, become a devotee, and uh, <clears throat> go all the way up, just like the, the yogic samadhi. Beautiful. So, Prabhu, thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. This is so nice. Do you want, yeah. So, what I, now, I've, I've heard about the, 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 when you study the Gita and teach the Gita, we do talk about the yoga ladder, but uh, what is striking about this is, how you are presenting this in not just you could say technical insider terms but universal uh, terms and frameworks like say, like say, simple utilitarianism uh, dharmic utilitarianism and then various levels and connecting with the different religions so what i am getting a sense is that uh, within the multi level school uh, multi level uh, frame of the gita Almost all thought systems can find a place, and uh, that's 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 what yeah. I where I'm aiming. Yeah, I'm and aiming the is, at the Gita as the universal global structure. Yes. So, see, and the other thing is that 
so the gita is not disrupting people from the normal conduct of life no. because whether you are at this level or this level the action is is like responsible activity in the world so it yeah, just it's it's always responsible activity it all it's always dharmic hmm. and, dhar- and dharma is for the betterment of society it's always dharma is always good for the betterment of society the betterment of the world ecologically that's dharma i mean if a thief would come and say well i'm also a, a, doing my dharma would say no dharma has its limits it has to be for the benefit of the society it's not that every action could be considered dharma okay. it has to be a ethical action within a framework to for the betterment of the world and in society uh, yeah. yes in, uh, yeah. in one sense it's uh, i have sometimes const- contrasted the gita and other literature so even when the gita talks about hell it doesn't talk about hell as a consequence of uh, as a as a punishment for non believers it is hell is a punishment for wrong doers like those who according to act account lust anger greed so the focus is more pragmatic rather than it doesn't uh, although it gives philosophy you could say it gives its own philosophy but it is not uh, what we can say it is not policing thought it is no. not it is not mandating a certain belief system in itself no 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 i think i think the way i see the gita is that it is uplifting the the message for every human being in all 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 night billion million uh, human beings on the planet uplift yourself uh, sublimate yourself become better purify your desires reduce your desires get become more spiritual in your path if you are a jew or muslim or hindu everything go up and up sublimate purify be a better person more dharmic it's all it's it's dharmic Uh, so, and that's how i see the gita as a, as a potential uh, as a potential uh, uh, world philosophy because it can embrace and accommodate so many philosophies and concepts and bring them all to the common ground of going up and going higher and higher so from my point of view uh, the variety of religions are not meant to uh, conflict with each other or compete but unite uh, for the cause of upliftment and here's a framework by the way the idea that dharma is a, can serve as a universal ethical framework is not my idea i mean years ago in oxford we had a talk by, by the late professor joseph o'connell who was very much close to the devotees mm-hmm. a great scholar of bengali studies and uh, law chitania and so forth and he said that in a lecture he said that the people who are thinking in terms of global ethics uh, mentioned dharma as a multicultural framework which can accommodate many uh, cultures and, uh, and and philosophies and uh, habits uh, into one it's good. it's it's part of the the, the beautiful multicultural um, feature of a, a, or character of dharma amazing dharma is like that is 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 in many ways i mean you would say hindu dharma but basically dharma to my mind is quite non sectarian quite a, a accommodating can bring many cultures together uh, and that's that's the indian experience i mean that's how india was always that's how india was so multicultural because you have this framework of dharma which can accommodate so many uh, cultures and ideas and into a in, into a framework so prabhu would would this the gita framework be also able to accommodate atheists Uh, yes yes or, it, it, it could say atheists or so let's say atheists or materialists who deny the yes 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 it could it thought. could accommodate atheists and materialists and oh. basically how it would it would talk to them through the gunas it would say uh, first of all i mean the minute they think in terms of the gunas that would change everything <clears throat> they would say first of all why don't you examine your own nature your own swabhava this was one of my points in my paper Uh, just look at the mirror the metaphysical mirror not the actual mirror and see what your nature is just look at yourself study yourself you have brahmanical tendency you have these tendencies that try to study your nature and try to study the uh, composition of your gunas i mean i'm aware of the composition of my gunas i i know more or less how my gunas work i know which kind of things i do 
Uh, I have my uh, advantages. I also have my disadvantages. That's I, I have a certain combination of gumanas between sattvic, which is more brahminical in teaching, and kshatriya, kind of uh, uh, ready to fight for my ideas. I, I know my combination. So people, atheists, could look at their gunas and see their gunas. If I mean, someone have to guide them. You have to be a little... Uh, 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 learn to do that and and from there that will take them into a journey of uh, sublimating their gunas they will go higher and higher I mean you have this also in our scriptures you have Migrari the hunter if you remember that story in the Chitana Charita Amrita he, he, he was uh, he didn't kill people uh, he didn't kill animals he, he, he half killed them so Nada told him at least kill them See, you have a saint here saying kill animals. But for him, it was an upliftment. Instead of torturing them, at least kill them all the way. Because the principle is always sublimation. And then, and, then, and then the hunter does it, but then he says, why don't go further? And he goes further and he asks his family about uh, their karma and eventually becomes a sadhu. But it did start by this instruction, uh, kill them to be a better person. I mean, so... So, so once you think in terms of the, of the gunas, wherever a person is, uh, the direction is, is good. I mean, a person is ignorance, is tamasic, so go a little further, you'll feel better. Go, become a little more rajasic, but don't be go so, uh, so, so gross in, tam in tamas. And then you become rajasic, so why don't you go to sattva? I mean, it, 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 it's a route which takes you upward, takes one upward, mm -hmm. and eventually, I believe, will bring you to bhakti. But, but at the beginning, even if one is an atheist, you could speak uh, to the atheist in terms of the gunas. That's the main thing about the, the Gita, is that it, it combines this guna theory, which is basically Sankhya, it's, it's basically secular, it's non-religious, it's, it's a Sankhya philosophy, uh, I mean, it's accepted as a Sankhya philosophy uh, 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 component, and brings it together and uplifts it or, 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 or uh, connects it to Dharma mm. and says, go up and upper from the gunas. So Although yes, the earlier, secular. So earlier three level, three, uh, three floor, three level and ladder, where does the, where do the gunas fit in? Where? Because uh, the gunas take you up. Here, here you have a person who's non-dharmic. Someone says, I'm an atheist. I have nothing to do with dharma. I do what I want. And you convince them to look at his, his nature, her nature, through the gunas. And then say, why don't you uplift yourself, climb up the gunas. So that will bring them to dharma. Because, and that is another point, if you examine the Gita, you'll see that sattva guna means to follow one's dharma. And for this, you have to read chapters 17 and 18, first, first part of 18, also, also, also 14, but basically 17 and the first part of 18 till 1844, that's, that's where the connection is made, that sattva guna means dharma, without regards to the fruits, enthusiastic, that's, 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 that's a state of dharma. So mm -hmm. if one thinks in terms of the gunas and one he tries to uplift himself or herself, that would bring them to uh, be dharmic. According to these chapters, 17, 18, they will start being dharmic. I'm, I'm dirty, I'm cheating, I'm a bad person, whatever. And then I start thinking in terms of, 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 this, uh, of uh, the gunas. Just by thinking about it, that, takes, that lifts my consciousness. I start to see things. I start to open up. I look at myself. I see how tamasic and rajasic I am, I'm trying to uplift myself, go up, my vision uh, expands, I start, I start to see the world from a more, uh, a wider perspective, I go upper, and what does it take me to be dharmic? Eventually, I'll be dharmic, and dharma, that will, uh, that will stabilize me, and put me in sattva, and then I'll think, how do I go further? And that will take me into uh, uh, the ladder, basically the ladder. Uh, I, I will try to be dharmic, but I will try to sublimate my motive and go upper to consider uh, the welfare of the world and then go upper and be a yogi and then start seeing Krishna 
and say, let me serve Krishna. But at first I will serve Krishna according to my tendencies, but I'll get a better, better taste for that. And eventually I'll go back home, back to God. That's basically the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the direction it goes. And that can start uh, also from tamas, for a person who's atheistic and tamasic, uh, who, who can just, who can just uh, uh, follow the Gita. I, 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 I'm giving, I'm giving a, a Gita lecture series to yoga teachers in Israel. And uh, last lesson, uh, a person, actually a devotee, he asked me, he said, uh, what if someone is homosexual? He said about uh, anyhow. So I said, from whatever point one is, one can rise oneself upper in the gunas. That's the principle. It's, that's the universal principle. Wherever you are, there's no question of judgment, you are good or bad. It's wherever you are, whether you are this or that, climb up the ladder. This is the basic yoga ladder, the karma yoga ladder. Go up. Mm -hmm. It's always, the, the, the journey always go up. The end is it, it's Krishna's lotus feet. That's the end. And the journey is individual. Wherever you are, you go up here, you sublimate, you improve, okay. but you go up and up. That's, that's the journey. That's, that's the direction. Uh, it's going so and it's and, uh, and, and approach to the yeah. this is a very very inclusive approach to the presentation of the Gita and this is sometimes contrasted with like many devotees and even devotees also present the Gita in a very exclusivist way so in the sense which that, means what exclusivist mean what exclusivist means like surrender to Krishna or anybody who is not a devotee is a demon ah, so, I see so that 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 also comes up sometimes. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying academic or scholarly devotees do that, but to some extent, uh, the the inclusivist approach that you have. So that means somebody could study the Gita without necessarily being, uh, uh, without even or not study the Gita. One could be living according to the principles of the Gita, even without knowing Krishna or focusing on Krishna or being devoted to Krishna. Because yeah, somebody is the yeah. level of karma yoga or, or yeah, yeah. You know, say, dharmic utilitarianism yeah. or some of the doing duty for duty's sake. So now, so then in that, if that is the case, then how do you see Prabhupada's presentation of the Gita? Prabhupada is presently, prominently is presenting from the third level perspective. Is it, do you see it that way? Srila Prabhupada. Uh, gave a very uh, deep um, uh, commentary on the Gita, and I was very deeply, um, very deeply uh, influenced. I give prayer to Prabhupada in my academic edition. I said I, 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 I first read Gita as it is by Shila Prabhupada, by Prabhupada, and that very much influenced my views. I, 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 I give the, cre the credit. So I would say that Prabhupada did that. I would say, as an academic, that Prabhupada's commentary is very religious. Okay. Religious. Means uh, Prabhupada very strongly emphasizes the divinity of Krishna and uh, translates many verses into devotional service, focusing Krishna. Means Prabhupada very strongly <clears throat> it emphasizes the religious aspect of, 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 of Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead and the direct connection with Krishna, uh, which is wonderful. I mean, that's Prabhupada's unique contribution. I think I defer, I think I, I'm interpreting Prabhupada as a devotee. I, 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 I feel more comfortable saying that I'm building bridges to Prabhupada, but I'm I am giving the Gita a more universal uh, applicability and perhaps less religious. Perhaps that's what I'm doing. Okay. I'm, I'm taking the Gita, oh, so when I, 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 but I, I'm keeping the same Siddhanta. I'm giving the same conclusion. As, as you saw, I, 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 I keep to prop a statement that uh, Krishna is the goal of the Gita. You saw, my ladder leads to Krishna. Devotional service, pure devotional service in, in the Charma Shloka. But my way of doing it will be much more universal uh, and dharmic in a sense. 
I wouldn't uh, press the, dico the, the dichotomy, uh, as you mentioned before, between devotees and demons and so I, I, I would do it in a much more uh, wide, universal, global way. Some people would consider what I'm doing to be compromising. Watering down, why don't you call for surrender? You let everyone be in the gunas and uh, climb from tamas to rajas. Just tell them, be heavy, surrender to Krishna, fools. Yeah, the devotees told me that. They said, your philosophy is watering down a uh, Prabhupada. Uh, you're watering down Prabhupada. Instead of telling them, surrender to Krishna, uh, you're saying, you know, so many stages and ladders and, uh, and, 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 uh, and so forth. So... I, I, I can accept, I can live with that uh, with that uh, critique. I can uh, uh, live with that critique. Uh, I think I hope I'm serving a uh, Prabhupada in my way. I hope I'm uh, uh, um, offering uh, the Gita to a wide audience. Uh, I think I'm trying to keep Prabhupada Siddhanta. Uh, I am saying openly that I think this is, this is my interpretation of saying that Srila Prabhupada built a house for the whole world to live in. So this is my own interpretation of this uh, statement, that the Gita is that house, not a physical a material house. Um, but I'm also uh, open to, to accept critics and saying that perhaps, you know, okay. should, should have been done differently. Every, I think it's in the Bhagavatam that every bird flies as high as its wings carries it. It's the beginning of the Bhagavatam. This verse. Yeah, <coughs> verse. Yeah, I think every, it, uh, uh, also it is there. That uh, yeah, different birds fly to different heights. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I may be a small bird. I, I, I fly lower. I fly between the bushes. And Prabhupada may be a high bird. He takes it out of the sky all the way to Krishna. Which is fine. It's fine with me. I, I, I'm, I, I feel very comfortable there to be a small bird going uh, near the bushes, but not going very high. But that, that, that's, 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 that's where I'm so, so uh, floating, uh, so to speak. I mean, that's your humility. I think you're also flying very high in terms of the intellectual depth that you're having in presenting the Gita. So coming to this, so the Gita, in one sense, what you are saying is, it culminates in Krishna, but it also yeah. accommodates people who are not yet ready for Krishna. Yeah, exactly. And it accommodates. I think this is the right term, and thank you for that. It yeah. accommodates in a very, very wide way. Many types of people, everyone can find their corner, their, their place, something for them. And once they catch the Gita in some point, something which they, mm -hmm. they sympathize with, that will take them up and eventually... Uh, lead them uh, to Krishna as pure devotees, although not necessarily in this lifetime and very quickly, it's a long march, but it, it will take them up, that's for sure. So in another sense, you know, you're not rejecting anyone. Say if somebody says the Gita is a Hindu book, it's saying, yes, it is a Hindu book, but it is more than a Hindu book also, because the identity yeah. of Hindu would be at the level one. Isn't it? Exactly, exactly. If someone says it's a Hindu book, I uh, you know, I'm a Hindu, not a Hindu, I would say yes, but this is this is level one. This is the humanistic point of view. It is Hindu. It's not, it's a, it's not Muslim. It's not a Christian. It's a Hindu book. I have no problem with that. Uh, but of course, <clears throat> even even uh, academically, the Hindu, the, the, the Gita would shift between being a Hindu, Indian, and universal. That's the three categories. Some people will consider the Gita to be a Hindu scripture, or it's the main of Hinduism. Some people consider uh, the Gita to be an Indian Bible. They say Indian Bible, the Indian book. Some people say that, even non-Hindus. I mean, I myself encountered uh, a professor a few years ago. I was giving a, a paper on the Gita uh, at uh, New Delhi, and a professor came to me and said there was a great talk. I said, thank you for that. He said, I'm very proud of you because the Gita is our national book. I said, yes, thank you. He said, yeah, you'll be surprised. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim oh, professor. Really? Yeah, he said, I'm Muslim. And I'm a Muslim professor uh, uh, teaching a, a 13th century Delhi Sultanate uh, history. Uh, but I'm proud of you because the Gita is our national book. And yeah, it was a learned person, very nice Muslim, and said very openly. 
So, so people say that, uh, and you also have to verify that, that the Gita is the Indian Bible, the Indian national book. Some people say that, no, a lot of mm-hmm. And then the universal, that's of course, I mean, there's a spiritualist, they see the Gita as universal. That's uh, since the uh, mid 19th century, you have these views of uh, Henry David Thoreau and Waldo Emerson uh, in, uh, in North uh, American Concord. Uh, they were saying, the Gita is like an empire, a universal scripture speaking about uh, existential questions which each and every human being is uh, facing. So you have this universal, basically the spiritualist, the new age, the spiritualist, uh, all around the world actually, uh, see the Gita in these terms. I gave a lecture two weeks ago to the Theosophical Society, Israelis, uh, adhering to uh, theosophy, Ani Bezant and, uh, and uh, Madame Blavatsky. Of course, they have Indian roots. So these people admire the Gita. They admire the Gita. They try to live the Gita. And some of them come to my Gita classes. They are theosophists. Uh, uh, you know, following Krishnamurti and uh, Subarau and people like that. So, so, uh, so, so you have this universalist approach uh, to the Gita also academically. Uh, so the Gita does shift between these three designations, Hindu, Indian, and universal. Nice. <laughs> and when we, are, um, when we are talking about uh, the Gita being appreciated at different levels, so still, what are the ways in which it might be seen as sectarian? Won't placing Krishna at the top of the hierarchy... Uh, be one reason to consider it sectarian? Uh, yes, well, basically, I mean, most non-devotees would consider devotees to be sectarian. As you say, Krishna's divinity would be, uh, I mean, yeah, Krishna's divinity. Of course, in my reading, I will go to more universal verses. Bumir, Apon, Alova, you. These are my separate energies. I mean, a more wide thing. But generally speaking, most people will consider uh, Krishna's divinity to be a sectarian feature of the Gita. Uh, that is, is true. Uh, and the Vedic gods to be a Hindu uh, gods. Uh, of course, I try to build bridges beyond that. I would say uh, Vedic uh, practices correspond to Jewish uh, halacha and so but most people say yes the, these are the sectarian features of the Gita Krishna's divinity uh, Vedic gods Vedic sacrifices uh, uh, Hindu geography of all the rivers I'm Ganges uh, Janavi uh, Ashvata trees uh, Ashvata Sarva I don't know so from that point of view uh, uh, the Gita will be considered more, uh, uh, I guess, sectarian. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. But that is just one aspect. You could, and then uh, overall, if we consider the Gita as a, how do we put it? We can consider the Gita as a book for potentially unifying the, uh, put it, put it, unifying the world thought systems. So. Another challenge could be that uh, see the Gita has been associated in people's minds with with certain certain specific uh, religions or specific ideologies. Like it has been used for Indian nationalism. It has been used. well. If, 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 so you could say of that course, those, you know. those are levels at which it can be used. But what you are saying is that is not the whole of the Gita. The Gita is much bigger than that. Yeah, well, well. first of all, uh, I didn't mention my other book, but the other book is called The Bhagavad Gita Critical Introduction, uh, edited volume, which was published just a few months ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, in that book, we have a chapter, uh, I mean, it's an edited volume, so it's by different, uh, different authors, uh, a chapter <clears throat> on uh, the Bhagavad Gita and the national, Indian national movement. And that chapter uh, discusses uh, Gandhi, uh, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, and Sri Aurobindo. Uh, everyone had a different approach, of course. Gandhi with his uh, nonviolent uh, interpretation, 
Balganga Darkitila, who is an activist uh, interpretation, and uh, Aurobindo Ghosh with the integral yoga, means that the person has to follow uh, karma yoga, uh, 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 jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga to be a full, full in one's personality. So uh, that we discuss in that book, at least three approaches, there are more, but at least three approaches, these, they, these were analyzed uh, in that book and they're quite different. I mean, Gandhi and Tilak are opposed, uh, if you want, on the question of violence. Uh, just to give an example. Uh, so, so but I want to also say something. That both of them, uh, so that, that, one way of looking that at that Gandhi interpret, interpreting the Gita in their own way, and that's their own ideas. The other way is that what you are saying is that the Gita is well, not enough to include both. I, I'm them. saying that the, the Gita, the Gita is very, very wide, and okay. it allows a variety of interpretations. You can, and, and here's an example, Gandhi and Tilak are quite different. They read the same text and come to different conclusions. But I also want to say that it, to bring a slightly different uh, perspective to the discussion, this is the 21st century and we're facing the rising of Asia. Asia is rising. That's a, that's a fact. That's I don't so think I have to argue minute, for that. One minute before. I mean, yeah. I, I would like to go to the geopolitical aspect because you had mentioned it earlier also. But just one point before this, see, when we say that the Gita can uh, can accommodate both, uh, Gita is wide enough to accommodate somebody who advocates uh, non-violence and violence both. Now, how do we avoid the danger of, say, uh, complete relativism? That we metaphysical philosophical relativism or that, 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 that reality is ultimately whatever you conceive it to be. That is something which I don't think the Gita is... Gita does have, as you say, it has its philosophy. It is. Where does I, I, it I'm not saying that. I, 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 I'm not saying that the Gita is relative. I think I, I, my own interpretation is very is very clear. First of all, it's the Harmic. I very strongly uh, endorse the Harma in all levels of the Gita. No, but and, there's a difference. See, there's a. You're not. I, it's quite clear. You're not endorsing moral relativism. But what about philosophical relativism? Moral, you're saying that all the levels of the Gita, they combine to, they all talk about dharma. So it's not moral relativism, but what, not, about, not ethical relativism, but philosophical relativism that, you know, you, okay, you are at this level, you believe this, but, uh, but say, uh, when atheists can be accommodated in the Gita, but atheistic philosophy, can that be uh, the, the philosophy that there is no soul? I don't think that philosophy can be accommodated within the Gita, isn't it? No, this, this is not the philosophy of the Gita. I, 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 I mean, uh, I, do you see an example of, uh, I mean, well, okay, now you are, uh, let, let me take the challenge. If someone came to me with a, 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 such a philosophy, I would have probably uh, tried to look for a, some kind of sattvic component in their philosophy. They would say, no, there's no soul. Okay, but I will try to say that, look for something. Uh, I will ask him probably, so what is there? They would say, okay, there's just matter. So I would say probably, okay, so at least you believe in Mumir upon all over you. Krishna says that in the Gita, I, I, I would try to look for a point where uh, they, uh, they, uh, uh, their philosophy would uh, be compatible with the Gita. That's basically myself. That's the way I would probably hand it. Uh, look for the uh, some kind of a bridge. Look for something which they say which could can find a place in the Gita. Uh, but of course, yeah. I, I, I I see the Gita as a, a structure philosophy, not a flowing. Not everything can be accommodated. Uh, of course not. I'm okay. I'm so, so what I'm understanding by what you're saying is that uh, that we while presenting the Gita's wisdom can accommodate people by seeing something which is something within their existing worldview or existing way of seeing the world, worldview itself. We can see some level of compatibility. Yes, like somebody may be an atheist, but there could be some aspects of their life which are sattvic. And we yeah, can... exactly. So in that sense, uh, so there is, so accommodation is different from relativism. That Okay, you have of course, a, of course. You have a place over here. 
Now that doesn't necessarily mean that this place is the ultimate or whatever. Everything about you is right right now. So okay. No, no, of course, of course. I, I of course, relativism is, is something else. I'm accommodating. That's that's my meaning. The Gita can accommodate, but the direction is to going up. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, climb that uh, ladder. C can we say say a word about this geopolitical uh, circumstances? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. So, so I, I'm, I'm saying I'm just to, to, to contextualize this a little bit. That like earlier you said that uh, in general Indian philosophy has been uh, studied through Western lens. So there is even in India right now, as India is rising economically and geopolitically. There is an increasing uh, concern among thoughtful Indians, intellectual Indians, that what is India bringing to the intellectual table? Not just as a, not just responding or reflect, uh, not just reacting to Western perceptions of India, but what is India itself bringing to the, we could say, the world table, world intellectual table. So I think that's a very. This is yes. Yeah, yeah. This is very strongly felt everywhere. I, I I very much agree with what you're saying. And a, a few years ago, I was in a. A, a conference in the New Delhi and about uh, actually about Asian philosophy. And I could see that among the Indians present, there were two centers. One was Gandhian studies, Gandhian legacy, and the second was Bhagavad Gita. And of course, these are closed because Gandhi was an adherent of the Gita. And they were trying to figure out what is our statement, what is our interpretation of the Gita, how can the Gita become our national book, what is the Gita philosophy? What is Gandhi and the Gita? I could see very strongly that the focus was somewhere between Gandhi and the Gita in this attempt to bring something to the world in terms of philosophy. It wasn't Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Mimamsa. It was the Gita. So many people, I think, feel that it's the Gita, which is that something. I may be wrong, but that's my feeling. Now, I was also working a few years in Hong Kong. You may remember, I came to see you when I was in Hong Kong on my way back to Israel. And in Hong Kong, I saw something similar. Chinese scholars, learned people, speaking in terms of let us uh, articulate a Chinese original philosophy. I remember one famous professor saying that now it's time for Occidentalism, not Orientalism, not the West <laughs> defining the categories of okay. Asia, telling the Asian how to think, but of us, he said, Chinese, I'm not Chinese, but he said, let's, let us Chinese define categories for the West. Let's be Occidental. We will state the terms. So anyhow, I see this happening. And basically the way, the, 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 the way I see it at the 21st century, we have basically three centers. One is Western, a civilization which is very strong and probably will continue to be dominant for years to come. It's not going to go away. We all think Western in so many ways. The second one is Indian, which is the second, a, a, one of the two big main Asian civilizations, India and China. Mm. So India uh, will uh, more and more uh, contribute its uh, uh, philosophy and uh, thought uh, or in originality. And the, the third is the Chinese, which is also a very ancient and big civilization. These are two big civilizations of Asia. Ancient, very sophisticated, and uh, of course, uh, many people follow them. You know the numbers, probably two and a half, three billion people just among these two uh, civilizations, Indian and Chinese. Hmm. Uh, now, uh, Within these, I see the Gita as the bridge between East and West. Now, please see my terms. East means China and West means the West. That's India is in between. Okay. Amazing. Now, what <laughs> exactly? Now, why do I say that? I say that because the, 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 the Gita is compatible with both sides. You may remember that I published a book called Brahman and Tao, comparing Indian and Chinese a culture and religion. And I made connections between the Gita and Chinese philosophy and religion. Hmm. Now, the Gita, when the Gita went to the West, the religious aspects were emphasized because the West was mainly Christian. So Krishna's divinity, 
religiosity, bhakti as falling at the feet of Krishna, praising Krishna, all these were compatible with uh, Christianity and with Christian uh, religious feelings. Hmm. So that's another answer. Why should a Prabhupada emphasize perhaps Krishna's divinity? Because it went well with Christianity. People knew uh, Jesus, you surrender to Jesus, and uh, you surrender to God, you praise God, and so forth. Now, this will not work with China. I've been there, I've taught there. With China, you have other aspects. And these are what I call the naturalistic aspects of the Gita, the gunas. These work very well for Chinese philosophy. Uh, you want to ask how the gunas work with Taoism? The gunas are like yin and yang and Tao. Beautiful, yes. Here you have the gunas and they are compatible with Taoist philosophy. And Confucian philosophy, very easy. I mean, if you read these chapters, 14, 17, and half 18, that's more or less Confucianism. Take out the uh, religious part of Krishna's divinity and look at the gunas, the division of the gunas, and you'll find the Junze, the, the, the Confucian Junze, the ideal gentleman working, enthusiastic, out of duty, without being a utilitarian, offering respect to the elders. That's the Confucian gentleman. I could put it in, 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 in a Confucius, uh, in a, how, do, how do you call it? The uh, Confucius famous book that uh, says, I mean, the, the, the aphorism of Confucius. I don't remember Lunyu in the Chinese. Don't remember the English name. And you, you won't see the difference probably. I would have put these verses there, how the gentleman, he is enthusiastic, out, out of duty, without regard to failure and success. Uh, I mean, that's Confucianism. So basically, the Gita will, will live very well with both East and West. With East, it is compatible with many Taoist and Confucian, and of course also Buddhist ideas about some sorry different things. And with the West, it has this theistic component of monotheism, of personal divinity. So I do envision uh, a bright uh, future for the Gita as unifying East and West. Uh, perhaps I'm a little messianic, but that's, that's the way I see it. That the Gita, the Gita is uh, uh, deeply connected with both East, means with Chinese philosophy and religion, and I mentioned both Confucianism and Taoism, and the West. It, it has many components which are uh, compatible with Western thoughts. So yes, I, I think the Gita has also a place in terms of the geopolitical uh, situation uh, to occupy within the uh, 21st century. It's not only an esoteric uh, scripture, it's not only Hindu, it's not only even Indian, it can be a, a major Asian uh, Asian uh, uh, philosophy or, or text. Let's see if it'll happen or not, I don't know. But potentially, I think it has the potential uh, because of its structure and components and uh, some of its ideas. That's amazing. You know, I think this could be a whole different discussion in itself because generally in, in India, in the Indian education system, Western thought has been studied to some extent. But I don't think Chinese thought, thought is studied much. But so this idea of bridge between East and West is not a bridge between India and, and uh, India and America or India and the West, but between China and the West. This is fascinating. So how is the is Gita, the Gita also, is in the middle? Is this, is this idea yeah. also getting a good response as such? Well, uh, I presented that in Hong Kong in 1912, in, 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 sorry, in 2019, two years ago. It was at the Hong Kong University, was received very well, but uh, uh, I don't think it ever went. Uh, see, uh, there is a publication, Indian publication, about uh, the light of Asia, which I published there. A, a few years ago, actually, I can show you if I'll, if I'll find that. A, yeah, this is a, a publication a, 
Indian publication. You see Asia in transition, it's called. And <clears throat> you can see the editors are all uh, Indians. None of yours is, is Chinese, it's uh, all Indian editors. Uh, yeah. Published in Kolkata. And this is uh, my paper. Uh, Toward the articulation of an Asian identity, the highlighting of links between the Indian and Chinese philosophy and religion. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, so that was published, I think 2014 or 15 or something. And uh, yeah, so I I I I, uh, I I I present these ideas there. I, I make these connections between uh, 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 Gita and uh, Chinese, uh, basically Confucianism and Taoism. That's amazing. So I think that this is uh, there is enormous potential in the avenue which you are exploring in presenting the Gita. So. I, I I offer my best wishes and prayers, and I hope that this podcast can help uh, devo devotees and the viewers come to know about your contributions. We'll provide links to your books also. If somebody wants to contact you personally, are there, is there some way to contact you? Well, email usually email is the best. Okay, perfect. So, so I, in general, toward the end of the podcast, I try to summarize what we discussed. And we went Please do. a lot of a lot of areas. So, but I'll try if you if you're okay, just summarize in a few minutes. So broadly, we discussed today about uh, how you have encountered and presented the Gita as a as a book of world philosophy. So the idea is that the Gita itself is seen more as a as you said eclectic book of wisdom which can transform people's hearts and tell deep truths. But because it's eclectic, it, it is seen as bringing in, not having a coherent or unifying thread, of, coherent message or unifying school of thought, unifying thread of thought. So what you did was you tried, you tried to present the Gita as a philosophy. Philosophy means that as a rationally developed, uh, developed uh, body of thought, and in the Vedic tradition, the Gita has been used or Gita has been seen as being used to contribute to various schools of thought. But the Gita itself has not been seen as having its own school of, uh, its own school of thought. So that is a, quite a significant contribution. And then through your books, which have won awards and which has been quoted and quite uh, lavish, I would say quite generously appreciated in academic terms. So that, has, that effort has been quite successful. And you talked about your journey also, how you were attracted to the Gita right from the early days. And then you focused on sharing it in your, focusing on it in the academic outreach. So the thrust of your presentation, from what I understood is there are three things. There are three levels at the presenting the Gita, the humanistic level, which is the Dharma level. Then there is the spiritualist level, which is the yoga level. And then there is the absolute level, which is the, the moksha. But then you present moksha not as impersonal, but moksha also as devotional. There's three levels. Many devotional. I, I emphasize devotional over the over the impersonal. Yeah, yeah devotional. So, so then, then there are various verses in the Gita which can be talked about at each of these levels. And Krishna doesn't reject any of them, but Krishna accord, accommodates them within a framework. And then to go from one level to the other, there are there is the ladder. And then the ladder you talked about how there are various levels within... And the key over here is that whatever be one's uh, one's level of consciousness or whatever is one's uh, conception of ultimate reality, the Gita focuses on dharma. So in one sense, dharma is one level in the reality, but also dharma in the three-level framework. But dharma is also the conclusion. That means exactly. Arjuna can see himself as the as a kshatriya and as a member of the Kuru dynasty, and still the call is you fight. And Arjuna can see himself as a as a, as a soul who is a part of Krishna and then also the conclusion is fight. And even yes. if Arjuna sees himself simply as a soul, then also the conclusion is you have to set an example for society and therefore you should fight. So in that sense, yes. uh, from a pragmatic perspective, the Gita can be very world building. It can, yes. it can be very, it can contribute without causing divisions. So quite often, Loka Sangra, exactly. Loka Sangra, yes, perfect. I was going to say, I say the same word. 
so so now when, uh, when because the gita has this uh, remarkable inclusiveness so different thought systems can be accommodated and at the same time uh, not that we go in for moral relativism because the gita does emphasize dharma and it's not philosophical relativism also because different thoughts have their own place and there is a hierarchy it is not that everything is right but rather the gita has the vision a gita provides us the breadth of thought by which we can see the good in various schools of thought and give them a place so even yes. atheism and materialism rejection of god or rejection of soul that does not lead to those people being rejected but whatever is good within them that can be seen and for that this third framework of the modes comes in where in that the, in one sense the mo, the idea of the gunas comes from the sankhya and sankhya we could say at one level is secular so so because it's secular it's more of say the way one behaves in the world the one way interacts with the world so one's uh, belief system doesn't matter so much and mm. this has enormous potential for expanding the reach of the gita because just as you mentioned socratic philosophy it it grew up within a uh, the the greek philosophy it was developed within ashram setting and the those philosophers or those particular proponents they had their own religious beliefs and their their ideas of worship but over a, because it has become secularized so it is it has a far greater appeal uh, so people may not want to join a particular ashram or worship a particular a particular deity but they want to explore thoughts and then now when we present the gita in this way many people who would not see it as who would not be interested in it if it were a religious book they become they will become interested in it and when prabhupad presents the gita you know he is giving very deep insights at the same time he is presenting it at the religious level and we can say that this the 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 prabhupad is presenting it at the level of the ultimate reality but there the gita also has ways in which it can be expl explained at various levels and so then you talked also about two things uh, that i think the last part was about um, how geopolitically speaking the gita can be a bridge between the west so the west has the if you consider west as broadly ar arising from the christian world view then the theistic aspect of the gita the devotional aspect of the gita can appeal to them yeah. and uh, if you consider the east china primarily china which is the super rising power now there the two schools of thought confucianism and uh, taoism taoism there the yin and yang and especially the concept of the modes and the concept of equanimity functioning with equanimity that is something which can appeal over there so although the, the theism is not there so in one sense the theism is there in the gita and also the if you can say the pragmatism how does one behave in the world that is also there in the gita and in that sense it can build a bridge between the east and the west so it's a uh, i'll say you know i have been studying and speaking on the gita for uh, two decades now more than two decades but uh, and i have read your book also but still i feel that i got such a inspiring uh, appreciation of the majestic breadth of the gita so thank you very much for sharing this wisdom through it's wonderful talking with you do you want to share any concluding words Well I want to thank uh, you for the opportunity. I mean uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you because you really have a deep understanding of the topic. I mean it's difficult for me to find audience who can go to this depth and uh, so it's for me it's a uh, it's a pleasure to 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 uh, to speak with you. It's 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 wonderful. I'm very grateful for that. And to thank the audience for uh, listening. I mean it's wonderful. Thank you very much for joining through Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.